great storm chasers and some all around great guys and got some amazing stuff. And uh, come back to the picture, guys. Okay, we got uh, three presentations we're going to do. Uh, two of them mine. My name's Jesse Rizzi. This is Adam Lucio, and this is uh, Skip Talbot. And Adam and I are going to do a lot about the June 17, 2010 outbreak in Minnesota. And then Skip has got some self engineered radar software stuff and video that he's going to do that deals with this year, some stuff from this year. So I'm going to go first, and we'll see if anybody knows anything about June 17, 2010, what was kind of unique about that day. Anybody remember? I lost the liberty. Here we go. <laughs> I was up in Grand Forks. We had four tornadoes. Yeah, the, the Grand Forks um, would have been, I guess, Sioux Falls, Warning Area, and then the Minneapolis St. Paul. I mean, probably the two big tornadoes that did that everybody might have heard of would have been the Albert Lee Conjure Supercell, and then Wadena, which was featured on Storm Chasers. So we thought we were, most of our team was out that day, and we thought we would go over the synoptics, maybe from a chase standpoint. What are some stuff, some stuff that we would want to look at that would have said, hey, there might be a big event this day, and what, uh, what kind of produced that um, cavalcade of supercells that day that just kept producing their work. I don't remember what the total number was, but it was quite a few tornadoes that were reported and confirmed. And for Minnesota standards, it was definitely an outbreak that hadn't been seen since probably the late 1960s. Right? It was stacked right up there. Yeah. Needless to say, it was a big deal, to, to put it lightly. So. Yeah, and the first thing I threw in was 500 millibar band. It's from 12 feet on June 17th. So this would be the 7 a.m. Let's see if I can zoom in here so you guys in the back might be able to see that a little bit better. And I take a look at this 500 millibar map and see what what jumps out at you. Negatively tilted trough. Okay, so we got we got a negatively tilted trough over here in the northwest. That's why is that usually something you would want to see bird or whatever. Yeah, because you can see if you look up here, you've got that divergent diffluent flow off. Notice up here in Minnesota. The um, pipe contour has kind of got that um, cattywampus look to it. That's kicking off convection in the morning. Any idea why that might be nature's hangover might be a little bit of a problem at 7 o'clock in the morning? Yeah, because there was a lot of concern. I'll show you a radar loop here in a little bit that there might be a little bit of a worked over atmosphere that could have very well killed the day. And then there's also a strong cold front, which we'll look at when we get to the surface chart, which if there's too much convergence and that moves too fast, it, there was the potential. I think a day or two out, they thought it was going to be a big wind event. Big linear day, not, not so much maybe tornado. We'll talk about why that happened in a little bit. Anything else that jumped out to anybody for June? Yeah, you've got that um, positive vorticity infection coming across the base of the trough. There's a, looks like a 60 knot little jet streak that's in there that's kind of headed towards the northern plains. That's always something you want to see because you've got that energy coming in. So it tells you by June standards of fairly decent setup. If the other surface features can coalesce with that, which happened, we ended up getting the instability and we had some surface so I thought I would throw that in there just to, so we could go over that and take a look. Got the, uh, on the left, I've got the radar loop, and then the right is the satellite loop from that day. That might be kind of hard to see, but you can see the ongoing convection in the morning, especially up there by Grand Forks and up north of the interstate. But that ended up actually also Wadena was up that way, so that ended up being a pretty active area, too, besides You'll notice the southern area kind of remained free of convection, which is one of the reasons some of us kind of targeted that first we were a little area worried that this was going to get worked up. The shear was there. That wasn't a problem. That was um, pretty magnanimous shear that day. But the question was, was the instability going to materialize where we were going to get everything come together like we needed to? Uh, take a look at the surface map. I'll see if I can zoom in. Anything look appetizing here? This is also 12D, 1230D actually. So we have 730 in the morning. We got a surface analysis here that's plotted. 
Southeast. Yeah, we got skies clearing up. Somebody said Southeast really wind. That's always good because that gives you that good backing ahead of your, your lift source, which is going to be this vigorous front out here, which later on will make its way through the Dakotas and head towards Minnesota. So surface low up here, that'll come into play. We also noticed there was a um, retreating warm front too, and that's something that you're, you're always going to want to watch if you're chasing because what is the front? It, it, it's a boundary, and especially in warm fronts, you've got a lot of enhanced helicity. And if storms can root in that boundary and then travel parallel to that, that's often associated with some significant tornadoes. So that'll be something to kind of watch as the day goes on. And one thing you should always do if you're chasing, of course, take a look at the surface map in the morning. You can even do, I think, COD has a site you can print out New York and analysis. If you want to print it out and actually do it the old-fashioned way, that's always a good way to learn. Uh, we talked a little bit about that kind of doing your own hand analysis and don't just look at models, can you take a look at surface stuff. So that was a glimpse at the surface, surface map. Of course, the SPC outlook did have a moderate risk and they had eventually upped it to the 15% or 10% action tornado risk. This was the 1630 view. <coughs> They're obviously seeing that this is looking like it's going to become an increasing threat. Probably get some tornadoes. Um, 18Z, this was, I pulled these off the meso-analysis graphics, the one on the left here is the height change, with the blue being height falls that are approaching the region, and then we've got the uh, <coughs> surface thing, the axis here, and notice what's starting to happen here. I mean, it's a bit like moisture cooling. Yeah, you got moisture cooling, and that's going to be behind that front, and that's something that you want to watch for, too, because that moisture cooling out ahead of that source of convergence is going to be significant later as the day goes on. This would be right after lunch, so the atmosphere is starting to heat up. It's getting cooked up, and we're noticing some of these features come together a little bit. Here's the uh, 300 millibar chart from 18. So this would be 1 o'clock. Again, anything jump out at anybody here? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we get that upper level jet streak moving in here. Notice Minnesota's kind of in its crosshairs. And if we were to overlay that on your surface features, you're going to find that that's also that front is, is moving that way. And that uh, the mid level jet streak gets out a little bit ahead of the cold front, which is going to come into play with why we probably had a pretty level strong develop that day to kick everything off. There's a water vapor imagery, I think Michael was saying last night when you saw that, that was a pretty like, classic, classic yeah. nice little dry punch coming in there that's going to enhance lift, and you can sometimes take a look at uh, water vapor and satellite to find boundaries and so forth. Good thing to look at when you're doing your forecast. This is an updated surface map, I believe this was from 3 o'clock, you can see the watch box is already out there. we got a warm front setting up in the southern part of the state, and here comes that cold front and the surface flows back up in here. So at this point, things were starting to come by about 3 o'clock. I think what time the watches go out around 2.30? 2.33. This was the uh, 18Z MLK profile and then the projected inhibition. There's not, you can see there's not much left. What types of numbers are we looking for with K that would be ideal for a set of, we got good shear? Yeah, 2,000, 3,000, you can see we've got some 3,000 values working in here, 1,500 to 2,000. This is just at 1 o'clock, so there's going to be a few more hours of service even before things get going. And you notice there's not a lot of um, cap left at this point, that warm, warm layer aloft that would kind of suppress convection, so that's starting to burn off. This is the uh, 850 millibar profile, the low-level jet. This should have been, I think, 23Z, which would be about 6 o'clock at night, anything? Uh, look at, look at, I mean, not, you can tell there's obviously a lot of moisture. How about a 50-plus uh, knot jet yeah. straight out of the south at 850 millibars? Screaming in there pretty well. You got out of the car that day, and you could just tell at the surface. I mean, the, the warm wind was gusting, pulling the door open. So very favorable 850 millibar profile. And you'll notice that moisture is just east of the state line, and it goes all the way up towards St. Paul and then up into uh, Alvarado and that area up into North Dakota. 
shear profiles, the one, the one on the left should be 0 to 1 kilometer, the one on the right 0 to 6 kilometers. So you can see 0 to 1 kilometer, we had 20, 30 knots of shear. That's more than sufficient. And then 0 to 6 kilometer, we got 40, 50 knots of work in. So, and that would, those would improve a little bit as the day went on. Here's the effective storm relative velocity, so we can see what type of you're going to have to see four and five hundred here. Those are uh, pretty high numbers. You know, even two to three hundred on a day like this would have been nice to see. But we're we're looking double up in here. We I think with Wadena was like six hundred, or six fifty or something up in there. There's a seven or eight hundred bullseye up in the northwest part of the state. They're closer to below. So plenty of listening to work with that wasn't a problem either then we did a I did a little um, surface hand analysis and went back because I wanted to talk about why this was more of a super cellular event than it probably would have been linear and you'll notice there is a if you can find it there's a little free running trough well out ahead of the cold front that's an area of elongated low pressure that sometimes develops out ahead of some cold fronts and any idea what the significance of that might be for the severe weather Okay, you got a, you got a source of enhanced lift. You'll look at the wind bars to the right of the line. You'll notice they're they're, they're well backed to the right to the southeast. Um, there's been a, some research done on these out of OU, and they think that these are often caused when the 500 mil bar main uh, street gets a little bit out ahead of the surface cold front, that it kicks up that prefrontal trough, and that's what but it doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. In this case, it did. And Skip, you might want to talk real briefly about what happened when you guys went to burn. Yeah, we, uh, we were initially charging a cold front, which would have been over here. And, uh, you know, cold front, uh, this is a quasi dry line, too. Anyway, we were driving west down 90, and we drove under a real robust cumulus field, which would have been. And uh, as we kept going west, we were still miles and miles from the boundary. As we moved further west, the cumulus thinned out. By the time we got to the to the cold front, there was no cumulus at all. And we're sitting there like, okay, this is not good. And it blew up. The storms went up in the middle of that prefrontal trough, well, well to our east. And the race back east to play catch up. Uh, we almost ruined our whole chase. And by overshooting the mountain, by overshooting the by what, 20, 30 miles. Yeah, at least. At least. And had that not happened, this probably would have ended up being a linear squall line type day because that had a big deal with the street. The frequent across are actually fairly common on the left between the coast because of the uh, Red River Valley there. Yeah. There's a bit of a vertical pressure gradient there. They, develop, they like to develop right in there. And if you're, if you're not really watching this set or looking at the surface observations, that'd be easy to miss. Because if you're just looking for the cold front, not paying real close attention, that probably would have been something that, you know, like in your case, some people could have overshot that just by not paying attention to the environment. So that ends up being a big reason why June 17th probably went discreet and did what it did in an otherwise favorable environment. And I think that's all I had on the synoptic. And so I'll let that. All right, so it's about a minute long. Let's see what you guys can pick out here. That's how you know I know what's going on out there. Um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what's the speed of that tornado moving? At this point, I believe it was, it slowed down for a time. Okay. I want to say around maybe 25 miles an hour, which is great as far as the tracking standpoint goes. Was it counting articles at this time yet? Yes, it, it took more of an easterly course at this point. Did it? Did you give you a hint, pay attention.
इसलिए माइनस वाई इज करें So, what was the obvious thing that everybody first noticed? And there was an RP there, so I believe. So, did you notice the intense wind shift there at one point when I stopped? So, typically you have your RP that kind of wraps around there. So, and then suddenly I noticed there was a rapid wind shift. I'm thinking, why is that? We have a main, we have a main tornado here where I would expect there to be an RP wrapping around, kind of coming around this way. And then all of a sudden you had this intense kind of gush of wind going the other way. So that's sort of the first thing that struck me out there. And, what, and then, I don't know if you noticed, but there was falling debris out of the sky right after that. I circled some of the pieces right there. They were sort of hard to see. They turned out kind of real quick. And then there's some landmarks here that you will want to reference later. Taking a look further out, this is actually the skip sphere. At the same time. And what we found in this video is there's a little anti-cyclonic funnel up there, which kind of grabbed my attention as to why was there a wind shift sort of where this funnel might be appearing. And if you notice, those are the same landmarks that were in the previous slide. So, you, have, you know, I, I lined out the lines of trees here and in the house, and there's that same house in the line of trees, and then you notice there's a little funnel top there. So that was kind of interesting. So now we're going to take a look at some more video. And this is actually Skip's video, and you'll be able to see this one. What direction are you looking at here, Skip? Yeah, looking north. He is north looking north. Yeah. 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 Watch right up in here. Two anti-cyclonic funnels. Two of them. Two of them. I'm trying to replay that for you so you can see it again. We didn't find them. Yeah, this is, we, we did this doing some post-radar analysis, which, which we'll go into in a little bit. We play it again. There's a laser pointer, yeah, I don't know. Watch, watch right up in here. One, two, 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 two. So that was kind of something that caught our eye when we were going over there. Could that have been something that played a part there? Now, one of the things we wanted to do was make sure that we're both looking in the same direction. So you can see here we have, this is my position finally here, and this is where Skip was. Now we actually took our GPS logs and went over this to make sure that he was in fact looking at the same direction. He was about, a, he was a mile further south than me. The tornado would be somewhere up in here. This is my position and this is my position. So we wanted to try to solve this mystery and look at it from every angle that we could. Here's some of the theories that I, I came up with. Is maybe the circulation from the funnel actually reached the ground. Now, if you remember the picture, that funnel was kind of high up there. So he would need some really intense vorticity that would be the, the stretching of the air that sort of allows these tornadoes to sometimes take that shape. Another thing I thought was maybe it was something called the vortex arch. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't, but if you imagine a horizontal spinning roll like the inside of a roll of paper towels, lifted that spinning bowl in the middle, the two ends would kind of come down like an arch, sort of like, imagine the arch of St. Louis. That's something called a uh, vortex arch. I thought maybe there, one of those could have reached the ground. This is something that's kind of new, kind of being studied. It's been found that there was actually a lot of this going on with the bottle supercell. And there 
tornadoes in Panama. You didn't see two tornadoes on the ground at the same time. As a result of this, I actually have a shot of you can see one there and then there's one way in the background. As a result, maybe it was just an intense artificia. You've all been out there spotting, chasing, and you're standing in the wind, and all of a sudden it does an abrupt, and then it was just an abrupt, abrupt windshield. Sometimes that happens. Maybe it was just a plain old random wind. Gust of wind. We had, we had intense surface flow from the southeast that day. If anyone was out there chasing, we had 25 knot surface flow out of the southeast, which is the direction that that gust of wind came from. So I sort of kind of crunched this around, did a lot of thinking, and here's what I came up with. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell I know what I'm talking about out there, right? So to be honest, I really don't know what the cause of that wind shift was. So this is sort of things that we like to do. We like to go over our video, we like to analyze, we like to research, compare and contrast, try to figure out why things are happening, and then what the potential hazards could be there. So did anybody notice this? When I zoomed it in the shot, there were these little spin-ups kind of going around the tornado. Might have been a little hard to see on video, so we didn't get a chance to get it again. Could the satellite tornadoes go even farther around? No, these were, these, these, these were a little bit different, but there were satellites with this tornado that day. So did anybody happen to catch those? One of the, and I, I didn't see it in person either until I watched the video. It shows up really good in the HD. But when I zoom in, there's, there's these, sort of these little, I call them little minions. Just kind of <laughs> spinning up and moving around the trail. I've never seen anything like that before, so to me that was very interesting and intriguing to see. So I raised some questions. How strong can they get? You've heard of multi vortex tornadoes where some of the vortices within there can actually be stronger than the main tornado itself. So the first question is how strong can these get? The next question is how far away from the main tornado can they actually travel? It looked like that was pretty close, but when you watch it in the video, it kind of goes off in its own little direction. The tornado's moving one way, and this, these little spin-ups are kind of going off in their own random weird ways. So how far can they actually go? And then why don't you see these on all tornadoes? And many of us have witnessed dozens of tornadoes in this room. This is the first and only time I've ever seen something like that. So that kind of really intrigued me there. Well, it looks like part of my uh, talk got cut off. I have one more for you. Um, we'll just jump right to our conclusion, I guess, and we'll play the video again, and I'll point out the clues for you. So the conclusion that I came up with is the main tornado can sometimes be a distraction to some of these other things that are going on if you're not. The tornado is the main draw. It's obviously our main goal, and we're out there chasing it. But sometimes it can actually be a distraction to some of the other things that are going on. So this further emphasizes the need that there is, we need to do a lot more study, we need to do a lot more research to really assess some of these hazards and risks. Sometimes the, the, the damage of the tornado, is it caused by the main tornado or is, is it caused by one of these sort of weird kind of side feature things that happen? And then last but not least, we we'll point out that always be on the lookout for the not so obvious. When you're out there, you're spotting, you're chasing, you're shooting your video, there's so many different things that can be going on. And never, never discredit any video you have because you think you might not have gotten something. Sometimes you go back and look and you can see things you might not have noticed the first time. And then it's sort of fun. Try to, try to study those things, figure out what was going on and make them happen. Why, why sometimes this is happening and other times it doesn't. So you know, there's more to it than just going out there and getting a shot. There's some real things that you can learn and maybe help you know, move the whole science and meteorology forward. Every piece of video could potentially lead to some new revelation, some new discovery. You just never know what you're going to see when you get out there. So we'll go ahead and do that video again. And this time I'll point out where the little spin-ups are, because I've, I've watched it so many times. I'm like, there it is! Yeah, I'll make, it make it look like I know what I'm talking about, because I noticed it right away. See if you notice anything kind of neat here going on. Yeah, this is this is only maybe 30 seconds after the previous clip. So that one was a little more obvious to spot. I know I noticed. So you may have noticed the strange snake-looking thing. 
some might have spotted that, maybe some of you didn't. But anyways, as I was tracking this tornado, this sort of giant roll just kind of came down and did its thing, and I thought that was kind of strange. So was there any recent phone that came out of on me at the time or from Well, just in that lowering. Uh, from from this area, no, there wasn't any piece of falling over here. Which probably would help you know, allow me to see it. So this is it. a lot of you maybe have heard of horizontal vortices. You see you sometimes see them with very strong tornadoes. If you've seen the footage of the May third night tornado, they had a very uh, strong yes, and had a very strong horizontal vortex, the Van Wert tornado. And a strong horizontal vortex, the Tuscaloosa tornado had like 20 of them just coming out from all sort all sides. This is actually something a little bit different. It's something that's called a horizontal green vortex. That's if we didn't have enough confusing terms in meteorology <laughs> as it is, we got one more for you. And this is again, this is Skip's view, he was a little bit further away, but he did ca capture the same feature on his video too. And we kind of labeled some of the graphics here to show what was going on. We have our RFP coming down alongside of it wrapping around like it should that helps give us our nice tornadoes and then we have your inflow and your updraft here under your base and they sort of kind of what happens is they sort of kind of butt up against each other which causes this roll and it, they just happen to happen to do so at the perfect balance to sort of cause this interesting feature which again this is the first and only time that i've seen that happen so there was a lot of different things going on with the setup of in june 17th and I think a lot of it had to do with the vorticity that day that just allowed for so much more stretching than usual. It was everything just came together to produce all these sort of weird kind of neat little things that you don't get to see every time. So these are some of the things I kinda of wanted to share with you and maybe be on the lookout for. Because you just never know what you're gonna see when you're out there. So we'll go ahead and play that last video one more time and I'll try to highlight the, the little spin ups there. Those are really tough to spot. But they're really cool once you see them. Everyone loves a video. Nothing new. Let's get to, let's get to the good stuff. Right. So we'll watch, well, I'll kind of watch the whole sequence again, and then the stuff will jump out more. I'll stop, I'll get blasted with the wind. Here comes the intense wind shift. And then if you'll see the, some falling debris here if it shows up there. One more look right there. My awesome explanation at the time. Yeah, that was my, that was my first day. A little satellite or it might have hit the It could have been a little funnel up there. Which to me is fascinating that a funnel that high can actually make ground contact. I'm, I'm gonna zoom in. They're gonna be right in here. Especially when I zoom in, they're right in here. There in front of the yeah, those bones actually went here. Right when I zoom in, you'll see them go right off to the side. There's one right here. Wait for it, wait for it. It's right here. Right here. It's going to start to spin up, and it's going to right here. Right there, there it goes. There, there. Right there, you see it? This little thing's kind of spinning up there. What's going on with that? And then there's just a big, cool multi vortex. Awesome tornado. <laughs> so that kind of does it for my little part, and I will turn it over to Sam. All right, so here's a synopsis. You're storm chasing, you're under the storm. It's raining, it's clear out ahead of you. You should be safe, right? You can't really see the left. You start moving forward, trying to get a little bit of a better view, uh, not really anticipating much, but then all of a sudden there's a break in the trees to your left and suddenly there's a tornado right next to you. It's not moving right or left or left to right, it's coming right at you. So this is a situation I found myself on, on uh, May 21 this year. It uh, really took me by surprise. That tornado was about 600 feet away at that time. And uh, it was one of the one of the incidents I'm not too proud of. We got a good shot of it, but uh, I'm in a rather dangerous position here. So I thought I would talk about uh, uh, how to handle yourself when you're near a tornado.
some of the do's and don'ts. <coughs> so I picked, uh, I picked three events from this year that I thought the tornadoes had some unusual properties. Uh, they did some things that I wasn't quite expecting them to do. And uh, I'll show you a video from each of the tornadoes and a uh, radar animation with my GPS position plot. So the first event, April 9th, uh, Mapleton, Iowa. Was anybody out on that day? Okay. We got one, two. Yeah, uh, F3 uh, went right through the town of Mapleton. Did a, did a lot of damage. I think there were some injuries there with that. Um, afterwards, there was a big nocturnal tornado outbreak that followed. The storm itself was uh, high precipitation, and the tornado, this is what made it uh, a little bit unusual, or what I didn't quite anticipate was, the tornado took a, a hard left turn. That's kind of common with, uh, with a, a tornado that ropes out, actually, but I wasn't anticipating it at the time. Uh, the next event we'll talk about is April 19th, down in uh, Girard and Litchfield, Illinois. Was anybody out on that day? Uh, I know you were. Okay, we've got a few more. Yeah. Um, Gerard was EF3, Litchfield was EF2. Uh, the Gerard tornado went north of town, luckily, spared the town, it did some damage to some houses outside of town, though, or some injuries. The Litchfield tornado crossed I-55, just north of Litchfield, right? Very close. Um, yeah, the storms looked like crap. Uh, they were junky on the radar, they looked real sloppy, real rainy. You wouldn't expect these nice tornadoes to come out of them, so. I mean, I wasn't really expecting to catch a tornado that day, the way the storms look, but they presented themselves. And unusual, this tornado made a slow, bright arc. So, and that I wasn't anticipating either. And then you saw a video from this tornado in the intro, May 21, uh, out Iowa Point, Kansas. That's way up in the extreme northeast corner of Kansas where the Missouri River is there. Um, yeah, uh, okay, so there's not many river crossings up there, and it's a lot of trees. It's a difficult place to chase. Uh, chase terrain is very, uh, very difficult. Uh, the tornado is actually not rated. I think it only did some tree damage, uh, so they didn't bother sending a crew out there. Uh, and it was in a severe thunderstorm watch. So, you know, you're out in a blue box, and you're out to get a storm. You're, you'd like your tornado, but you're not expecting one. So I think I, I get a little bit careless, uh, underestimate the storm a little too close, and all of a sudden there's a tornado right in your face. So, we'll look at uh, some video from each of these. Alright, uh, before, uh, I'll go over kind of a do's and don'ts list here. Uh, I don't want to preach safety, because most of you guys are chasers, so you might agree or disagree with some of these, but these are lessons that I learned the hard way, and uh, I thought it'd be good to share some of them. Uh, to me, my biggest rule is uh, maintain situational awareness. When you lose that, you know, it's really dangerous because you don't know where you are in relation to the storm, where you are in relation to the tornado. Um, you know, you want to be able to see where the storm and the tornado is. If you can't, you need radar. If you lose, if you lose that data, either from your eyes or from from your laptop screen, um, <clears throat> I think it's time to you know pull the plug on the chase. Uh, the next thing is you want to be two or three steps ahead of your storm. Um, when you get into trouble. You know, it's usually a series of mistakes that you've made along the way that you know, put you in that situation. And then always have an escape route. I'm sure you've heard that before, and that's a, and that's a fundamental rule of chasing. Um, but in picking a good escape route, I mean, I see, you know, sometimes I do things and I've seen things where, you know, that wasn't the best, you know, course of action to take. Um, you want an escape route that, you know, obviously leads away from the tornado. You don't want to be... Uh, cutting across the bear's cage. You don't want to have to cross the tornado's path in order to do your escape route. Uh, and you want to make sure your escape route is open. So if you haven't driven down it yet, you don't know what's out ahead. The road could be closed. There could be a tree down. It could be flooded. There might not be any road there at all. So Adam and uh, Danny had a nice time with that out in Bottle last year. Uh, <laughs> their, their road just wasn't there anymore, so, you know, the tornado's behind them. So, uh, and the other thing is you don't want to have to race to use your escape route. So, if, you know, if you have to start flooring it, you know, you're going to get into an accident, you're going to wind up going off the road, something. You want to have enough time to get yourself out of that situation. 
So and the other thing is, your escape route is your last resort. <clears throat> um, again, like if you're taking your escape route, you've made a few mistakes already that, that caused you to do that. Uh, don'ts, real quick. Um, you know, again, this is your own personal opinion. You know, people chase how they want to chase. Um, they take varying levels of danger. Um, I would core punch or hook slice without um, having that situational awareness. When you drive into a storm blind, you can easily drive into a tornado. Um, you don't want your escape route to have any unknowns. A uh, great escape route is the road you just came down. So if you can just turn around and go back down the same road you were just on, that's the perfect escape route. Um, and don't underestimate your storm. I do this a lot because, you know, I watch a lot of video and I've developed this weird opinion that a lot of people <coughs> hype their storm too much. Like, oh, look at this funnel cloud. Oh, that's a great looking storm. And I'm like, there's no funnel there. It's just scud. So, and I wind up, I wind up doing that to like the storms I'm under. I'm like, it's scud, scud, scud. And then all of a sudden the scud starts spinning and it's, you know, right in front of me and now I've got a problem. So, okay, we'll look at Mapleton first. Uh, my chase partner shot this, uh, Mike Boyd. Uh, this was his first really big tornado. He was a little, he was a little spooked. Uh, we are hook slicing, so we're coming in from the west. Um, we're kind of in the precip of the hook itself. Tornado's off to our east, and it's moving east. So my chase partner, he, he, he's lost the situational awareness that I was talking about. He doesn't know which way we're going, he doesn't know which way the tornado's going. So when he sees the big tornado now, he's, he's basically panicking. We had to really reassure him that we're in a, in a safe position here. <laughs> yeah, we were probably about... A, Quarter, third of a mile, half mile, somewhere in there, distance wise from that tornado. So. This tornado is moving east now, east northeast. And I've been watching it, you know, so I, I generally assume tornadoes go basically one direction. So I'm watching this go east northeast, so I'm just going to follow behind it a little bit off to the north, and we should be in a safe position just behind it. So. That was a power flash that's just entering the town of Mapleton. I looked down on the map now and realized that, you know, we're looking this way, Mapleton should be right about that way. And it's about that time that I realized that the town was going to get a direct hit. How close was he to him? Like when it was all alone, got as close as. Um, when we first got in, there was probably about 1,500 feet, and we get close again at the end. And that's that's what I was going to kind of talk about with this video was, um, you know, it did that unanticipated left turn, and we tried to get it close, and we got pretty close to it again there. So you'll see that in a minute here. Did you have a lot of other chasers in the same position you were, or were you guys by yourself? We were, uh, I mean, there was another car by us, and I think they were local. I think they saw us and were following us because they were asking us questions and they were a little spooked themselves. They followed us, but I think we were one of the few cars out on this road. So yeah, now we lost our visibility. Yeah. That was from a year ago. I remember that story. So the tornado is now rain wrapped, heavily, heavily rain wrapped. We can't see anymore. I'm, I'm just thinking the hook has moved out in front of us, and if I cut back through the hook, if I slice the hook, we're going to see the tornado again. So we go forward, and now we're really close. There's the right edge of the tornado. So 
again, yeah, we got really close here, and uh, I wasn't anticipating this. This tornado turned left right in front of us. If our road had ended here, uh, we could have, you know, easily kept going and got even closer. So, I mean, hopefully, we would have realized there was a big tornado right in front of us. But that gets a little dangerous because you can easily drive into the back of a of a tornado through your hook slice when you don't have. So I'll play the uh, radar animation from that now. All right. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of people on this map. So the red car and is Nick Nolte, and I'm in the white car, and we're in the same position, so we're overlaid there. Adam is in the black car. Uh, sorry, Nick Nolte in the red. No, I'm sorry, I've got to call that. Jesse is in the red car. All right. Uh, we went north. <laughs> they stayed south. Okay, this is probably a little bit safer position to be in. Uh, Adam's playing with some gust tornadoes here. He's right in the rear flanking gust. Uh, but he's playing with some big gust tornadoes. <laughs> We now realize it's a tornado warning. We're hustling to get back in there. Now we're staying north of the hut. You can kind of see the supercell. The storm's far away from radar, so it's difficult to really you know, see it. But here's a big sloppy HP hook. We're hook slicing now. We're coming in from behind the hook. The tornado's right here. It can be plotted. There it is. The F3 turns sharp left and goes right through town. So, much safer spot here. Uh, it'd be better closer to being there, though, and it's a trade-off. Um, there's your sunset return as the sun sets. So now it's after dark, and we're following up the storm. Nice info notch here. We get right in the info notch. Big RFD gust front was visible there. And about now is when that nocturnal tornado outbreak really started. So several tornadoes spit out of here. Uh, Jesse got really good shots of them. How many did produce? They surveyed they surveyed the they yeah, surveyed maybe 11 or 12. Yeah, there, there was an F4 in that, in that mix somewhere, up by Pocahontas. We got great F4. <clears throat> um, there were some multi simultaneous ones down at the ground at the same time. Is that time. down a week after right there? Yeah. 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 And this is still producing here. Is that the night that they got the video of that point? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay, so here's some just some freeze frames I grabbed out of that animation so I can show you a little bit better detail. Um this is kind of the overall view of the storm before it produced. I mean, it looks kind of junky here. When you think of a great supercell, it has some real nice full of fine claws. Uh, it looks really kind of globular here. Uh, it's because the storm's far away from Des Moines. That's the site I used for this. Uh, Omaha was about the same distance. But you can make it out here. Uh, kind of a flying eagle here. You've got an HP hook echo right here. So. Uh, your tornado, if it's going to form right now, it's probably going to be right in here. The rear flanking gust uh, front's going to be right there. You're going to get real big hail right in here. We were getting golf balls about that time. Um, Jesse and Adam were getting great gust tornado video here. They, they were rolling right over the top of them. It's pretty intense. Um, here's Mapleton. Now, when you're looking at this map, like imagine you're, this is where you are right now. Where are you going to go? How are you going to continue this chase? Uh, you've got a great road network here, but look what's right ahead of you here. Uh, this, this messed up a lot of chasers. Uh, we kind of did a gamble here. We found a decent road that like snaked its way through here. Now, we stayed behind the storm, so we were in a fairly safe position, but you know that road could have easily gotten washed out or flooded, and that would have ended our chase. A lot of people came down here and went back up like this to Mapleton. Some even came down through here. We did kind of a direct approach from there. Uh, here's a real tight zoom in. Um, you have to 
trying to use your imagination as one big red blob here, but this is the hook echo here. This is like the, the bottom of it. You can see how bad the terrain is. Lots of hills, lots of trees. Uh, here's our road. It snakes along here. Um, I want to say, well, what's your escape route going to be? Well, the tornado is probably going to form right here. So if we needed to go, we could just easily turn around and go back to the storm ends right there. That would have been a safe spot to be. You could get yourself into some trouble, maybe if you were here or out here and the storm's moving this way, right? So if your road's out here, go to craft, then that storm's going to run you over pretty quick. All right, so and here's Mapleton. Um, this was about when it was at our close to both of us. That's uh, McNulty's car. That's our position. So we're looking southeast at the tornado. It entered Mapleton and then turned left here. So we approached it here. Um, it's a pretty safe approach. We had a good view. Sometimes you don't get a good view when you approach it with that. The precipitation from the, from the hook cuts off your view, and it did at the end there. So yeah, you can see where it made that sharp left turn. The tornado went like this, and then it went cut, boom, north, right through town. And it made a swath of damage right here, the southwest corner where the town was hit the hardest. So, and that's where I thought we could have gotten into a little bit of trouble, because I wasn't anticipating this sharp left turn. Had our road gone, you know, straight across and connected here, I could have easily gotten a little too aggressive and maybe, you know, pushed it trying to get our view back. We could have, you know, crossed the tornado's path right there. So, uh, what we could have done better, um, I don't know, we might have had a little bit better view staying up on this road here. Looks like the train was a bit better to the south. Um, to the south here, you probably lose your view because the storm was HP. So these are some of the lessons I learned from that chase. Uh, you know, anticipate a left-turning tornado, and that's common when tornadoes roll about. You jog to the left. I don't know if you've seen the Greensburg um, damage path. It, you know, it's going northeast, and when it died, it turned hard left, and it almost like a little curly cue at the end there. It almost went clear out of the storm. Actually, it turned left so hard. Um, and when it does that, they get heavily rain mapped because when, that's, when that tornado turns left, it goes right into the, the forward core of the storm. Uh, so and that's when you have to be careful because you, know, you lose your view, the direction the tornado is chasing. If you're hook slicing, if you're in that north position, you got to watch for that. Um, and yeah, you want to keep your chase partners up to date on what's going on because you know, we, had, uh, uh, we had some issues there with people not knowing where the tornado was and where it was going and whether we were okay. Uh, okay, next event. This was April 19th, Girard, Illinois. Okay, so storm was a little bit junky, lots of rain, kind of scuddy. There's a big, big clear slot there, right? It's cutting in the RFD clear slot. Okay, now we've got a white bowl here. We weren't quite sure what was going on there. Thought it might be a tornado, but then we saw a little white tufts kicking up here. You'll see those in a second here. Once we saw these vortices kicking up on the ground, we realized we had a tornado. You can see them spinning up there. This tornado is moving northeast. We're paralleling it on Highway 4. So uh, this is a great road to chase on. <coughs> Going right along with the tornado. We'll go right through Girard, pick it up on the other side of Girard. And we'll get our view back again, and it'll be right there again. It'll be in the same spot, right where we left it. So, just continue on going. We're well, maybe a mile from it. It's, uh, it's in a nice, safe position. We're not under the storm at all. Power flash, yep. Yeah, it's, that's the west side of Girard hitting some structures over there at that point. Okay, so now we're going into Girard, and we're just going to blast through town, come out the other side, and pick it up again. What was our rating on this? Uh, F3. Alright, so here's the north side of town. We're coming out of town, and I'm expecting the tornado to be a mile off to my left again. And what's coming over the top of the buildings and the trees? Okay, so now it's a lot closer than I thought it would be. What is this tornado doing here? So, 
So we stopped here, we're like, okay, are we safe? Is, is it going to come at us? You know, which way is it going? And we realized, okay, it's going to cross the road here, we're probably safe. I was worried for all these cars. You know, all this traffic was coming down Highway 4, I thought somebody was going to get hit for sure. So, but yeah, it did a, did a right turn as we were in town. So it came out a lot closer than we were anticipating it. So luckily we saw it coming over the top of the, the houses when we were exiting town. So once across the road, we uh, pretty much determined that you know it was safe to get a little bit better view. We had a building off to our right, so I pulled us forward to get a better shot of it here. Those tail lights in the left, that's uh, Storm Chaser Paul Hatfield. Actually had to bail out of his car and go in the ditch because that tornado snuck up on him too. But yeah, you can see a ton of debris flying in the air. So. Did you get any RFP? Yeah, we're. And we're now behind the tornado. You can see we're now losing our view. It's getting rain wrapped. The precip from the hook's hitting us. So, yeah, we're just getting buried in rain and hail now. Really, really strong wind. I thought these lines were going to come down, so we turned around. Then we tried the core punch and stormed to our south that also produced the very photogenic F2. And the winds on this storm were stronger than being that close to that F3. And the wind was so strong at this point that I thought we were driving into a rain wrap circulation. So I turned the van around and we got out of there. Uh, we aborted that. So, uh, but it turns out we we're actually about six miles from that tornado. We were just in a really, really heavy downpour. So I'll put an animation in that radar animation. Okay, here we go. We all met up at Effingham. Everyone said, screw you. We're all going our own way. <laughs> Get your own tornado. Uh, there goes Lucio. That's me. I didn't even know Nolte was that close to me. So, you know, we split up there again. We crossed paths and we found a uh, Vanna here. Didn't even see each other. Uh, storms are way off to the west out here by St. Louis and the Mississippi River. Put down a photogenic uh, tornado near Bowling Green that we kind of got. Now, we're, we're basically going for scratch. Like, ah, oh, crap, we missed the one tornado. We might as well go for these storms now. Uh, so we're coming in, we're all coming in late after our one front target. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Here's our first line of storm. Um, multicellular, right? A kind of a floppy line. You can kind of see some pendant shape organization here, but I mean, this is not something I'd expect. Big tornado down. So, and this looks real sloppy here. And about this time we got our view of the clear slot, we really started to organize, and then we had our tornado. And we watched it turn right, across right in front of us there by Gerard. Good back to come Yeah. And then we decided to get back on tail, and Charlie down here, here is Adam, now in position for the Litchfield tornado. You can kind of make out a whole school, it's real sloppy. <laughs> yeah. So, and we tried to cut through here, and that's when we just got hammered. Hammered with rain and hail. The most intense wind I've ever experienced on a chase. And we were a good five or six miles from that tornado stuff. So, so, just buried in the forest. Here's a zoomed in animation of our Girard intercept. Here's the town of Girard. Uh, here's our storm coming in. Come down, and here's that highway I talked about that paralleled the tornado. So the tornado started out moving more or less in this direction here. Here's kind of the hook echo where it formed, uh, where we started to get our good view back. Here's multi. So there's our tornado going along. We've got a nice we're paralleling it nicely, it turned right there, coming through town, and then it really crossed right in front of us, right there. So it really wasn't too much on the ground at that point. It was, you know, kind of a weak roping out circulation there. We weren't getting dangerously close again at that point. So yeah, here's where we attempted our core punch, and this reds are 50, 60 PVZ values. And, you know, we're still miles from Litchfield before we didn't even get close to that tornado. 
and that was about the point where we pulled the plug there and bailed out of there. That tornado was still several miles to our south. Uh, yeah, so here's some still grabs from uh, from this event. Um, the storm had a kind of a weird double low to it. Uh, when we spotted the tornado, I saw two appendages coming out the bottom of the storm. Now, this is the hook here um, that produced this this uh, tornado now. At this time, uh, you know, the scan's already a few minutes old. So the tornado would really be about here in terms of the hook. But we saw this weird thing here. We didn't know quite what was going on there. Some sort of blob of precip, maybe some planking line cell that was being adjusted in the storm. I don't know. We kind of thought there might be two hooks. So I wasn't sure which which of these appendages that tornado was associated with. So we kind of assumed it might be this one, so that, you know, later on when we were, you know, up here getting into the, the hook precipitation, we thought, okay, well, there's another hook, and there could potentially be two tornadoes. So that had us a little concerned there. And then, yeah, here's, here's our point of close intercept. Uh, here's the town of Girard again. We are about 800, 900 feet from the tornado at this point where it crossed the road from us. So, and it, it made this big, wide turn through town and did this nice right turn there. But that's what caught us off guard, so we weren't expecting that turn. So, lessons learned. Uh, you know, I'm guilty of this constantly. Don't assume tornadoes follow straight paths. You know, they usually do have some sort of deviation. I think it's usually to the left, near the end of their lifespan. Um, but with a right-turning tornado, that's common on a storm that's rooted on the boundary. You know, your supercell has a tendency to turn right, thus your tornadoes often will turn right as well. Um, yeah, be really careful when you lose your visibility. So going into Girard now, we had a couple minutes there where we, we, we can see the tornado anymore know which way it was going. So we come out of the, on the other side of the town, not knowing where it is, and we're surprised when it's not where we expect it to be. Uh, and yeah, again, be, uh, be ready to use your escape route. In that case, I think we would have just turned around and gone back through Gerard. That gets a little dicey too, though, because you know, you're in a town. You know, there's there's going to be traffic, there's going to be debris, potentially. It's not a fast route. If the tornado is just off to our left, you know, it might have taken us a while to get out of it. <coughs> Finally, this one we started on, the Iowa Point tornado. Here's time-lapse to start with. A lot of scud. And I'm racing this wall cloud trying to get to my river crossing. So I see scud, scud, scud. It's all scud. I got out and felt the winds. It was outflow. You know, outflow, severe thunderstorm watch, bunch of scud, rain. You know, and then all of a sudden, one of these pieces of scud extended all the way down to the ground, and it's corkscrewing at the bottom. It's like, okay, we have a tornado. We back yep, back up. We stopped and watched it for a few moments. <laughs> That's the first thing I do is I like to, I like to, I like to pause and see which way it's going. So we stop and watch it. If it's going to the right, it's going to go in front of us. If it's going to the left, it's going to go behind us. Well, it's not going either way, it's coming right at us. <coughs> so we back up, turn around, and uh, this road was weird. It kind of went towards the tornado. So now it's basically chasing us down the highway. Across the road here, and uh, probably would have been an F0 if it was rated. Just the tree damage from what I saw. Um, but it crossed about 600 feet from where we stopped. So if you're a little bit, you know, early, didn't see the tornado until a little bit later. You know, those trees could have been coming down on us. And you can see it's basically woven out here. But terrible place to chase. Look at these trees. Just, you can't see anything off to the west. And I'll show you here why. We made that such a bad area to chase. All right, so here's our supercell. We're in a good spot. We're right out ahead of it. Great road network. Look at this grid here. All these highways to pick from. Northeast Kansas. Great place to chase. Uh, we stopped here right in front of the storm. Just a rain-free base here. Nothing too spectacular. We let it go over the top of us. Got some golf ball-sized tail. 
Um, here's Hiawatha, Kansas. Now we're just going to basically stay in the core of the storm just to keep up with it here. You know, I'm not too concerned about the storm. It's a severe thunderstorm watch after all. Um, and about this time now, we're trying to decide what do we do? Do we cross the river or do we play with it now? And, you know, we took a look at the base. I turned us around here at some point and said, no, we're going to make for the river crossing. But then the base really organized, so we decided to stay with it. And the gamble is, you know, it could produce on the other side of the river, and we're stranded now and we're going to lose it. So. Now here's our intercept route. This is where we saw the tornado cross right in front of us. We turned around to get out of there and then get out of the core again. But, uh, but yeah, this is a terrible place to chase, this highway here. It runs right along the Missouri River. There's hills and mountains off to the left and lots of trees. Just these river roads make a terrible place to chase. Here's a zoomed in view of our intercept. Uh, we're getting a nice wall cloud here at this point. Um, and here's our river road. I mean, you can see all these mountains. Uh, here's the Missouri River. Um, you know, when you see when you see this kind of stuff on the map, and you're getting this close to your storm, you should really think about you know not not continuing your intercept. You know, going along the long you know a long way and finding a new point of attack. There it was crossing right in front of us. Again, here's just a screenshot of, of the terrain that we were working with. Terrible, terrible road network. Um, what we could have done better, maybe. Um, I don't know if I can show it much here. Uh, this one shows it, kind of. Um, the storm uh, kind of ended abruptly off to the west here. Um, instead of, and what I was really doing here, and this is, again, this is foolish. I would not recommend this. I was trying to race the wall cloud across this highway and get up to the town of Rulo, Nebraska, which is the closest river across. So I'm trying to get out of there before it <coughs> crosses my path. And you know, we didn't we didn't win the race. Um, just behind the storm, it was pretty clear. And you could see through the clear spot the back end of the wall cloud was just nice white color. What would have been better was to maybe take one of these roads here. You know? And uh, stay behind the tornado, you're in a safe position then and you probably would have had a better visibility. That's something I would have done differently. Because we were initially behind it and we had a great view. It was when we got out ahead of it that we got into this terrible place with the hills and the trees. Flat river plain here with uh, uh, with a great view um, and then just terrible off to our west. So we couldn't even, just before we saw it, you know, the tornado was probably here already. We had no idea it was that close. Um, you could have gotten into some real trouble if maybe you were here. So you're like, I can't see anything because he's hills in the trees. I'm going to turn down this little road where I'm going to have a better view where it's nice and open. Okay, well, now here comes the tornado, and where's your escape route? It's right back where you just came, and your tornado is now coming down your escape route. So I think that would be probably, probably screw up the, the most in that situation. Um, uh, if you were able to get across the river with plenty of time, or maybe you started on the other side, great places to spot all along here. It's wide open. You've got a little bit of a road grid to play with. You could easily escape down this highway if you needed to. But, you know, the trick is getting there in time. So, I mean, you have to make a gamble when you're on the west side of the river. Do I leave the storm and miss the tornado? Or do I stick with it and miss the tornado when it produces on the other side? So, lessons learned again. Don't race the wall cloud. Uh, don't drive underneath the wall cloud. Uh, again, I'm underestimating it because, you know, it's a 5% tornado risk. We've got a severe thunderstorm watch. It's just a day to get a good structure shot. And then we're surprised when we actually see a tornado. Um, we've got hills and trees on the left side of you. Obviously, don't cut through the bear's cage. And I think that's all I got. Does anybody have any questions for any of us? Me, Adam, or, or Jesse?